This is the first video available closest to the time of failure, and you can see the outcome of the water at tailings leaving the breach of the structure. It's that event that brings us here today because shortly after that event, the government of British Columbia with the two First Nations established uh, this independent um, investigation into the cause of the failure. Uh, we were formally organized toward the end of August and began our work in earnest about that time. And it's important to uh, identify the, uh, going to the presentation itself, important to review what was the purpose of the investigation of, the, uh, of our inquiry. It was to investigate and report on the cause of the failure of the tailing storage facility in addition, the panel may make recommendations to government on actions that could be taken to ensure that a similar failure does not occur at other mine sites, which is an important uh, purpose. The panel is authorized as part of its investigations and report to comment on what actions could have been taken to prevent this failure and to identify practices or successes in other jurisdictions that could be considered for implementation in British Columbia. Going further from our terms of reference, it was expected that we would identify any mechanisms of failure at the tailing storage facility, identify any technical management or other practices that may have enabled or contributed to the mechanism of failure, and identify any changes that could be considered to reduce the potential for future such occurrences. Uh, this remit, or charge to the panel, was fundamentally technical in nature, it's important to recognize also, in our terms of reference, what the panel did not do. The panel was required to perform its duties without expressing any conclusions or recommendations regarding the potential civil or criminal liability of any person or organization, and we steered to that obligation very carefully. Um, and use wording to, uh, to avoid any indication of that direction. We are also required to ensure that the conduct of our inquiry does not in any way impede or conflict with any other ongoing investigations or proceedings related to these matters. The ones in specific are those being conducted by mines inspectors and by the conservation officers or other and other regulatory agencies. Uh, in that context, um, we were asked to um, have our report uh, inspected by the conservation officer uh, who did identify a couple minor changes and also requested that some of the uh, items of documentation that we referenced would not be immediately available on the website in which you'll find all of the other sources. We were able to accommodate those requests without in any way jeopardizing the integrity of our activity. So what did we do? Firstly, we had major tasks of, of uh, technical activities to undertake in the field, drilling and sampling, and we retained uh, the company Thurber Engineering uh, to assist us in those regard, that regard, acting under the direction of the panel. Uh, we solicited, we obtained from the various stakeholders uh, the documentation, the files of the government, of the mine owner, of various consultants and the like. We solicited uh, information from the public at large. We conducted a number of personal interviews and we undertook uh, a various series of complex analyses that ultimately uh, led to the final reports that you see together with appendices and attachments uh, to, to indicate, if you like, by mass, the depth of our inquiry. It was our intent to, of course, be comprehensive, thorough in our investigation, uh, to be open and transparent in our documentation, and at least by volume you can indicate uh, the, the, uh, the test of that when you have the chance, as you will later this morning, uh, to inspect the documents. So before proceeding technically, uh, we should get a sense of, of where we are and, and uh, uh, geometrically, the tailings facility, you see, had three legs about it. It had what is called a main embankment, a south embankment, and a perimeter embankment 
as we see to the, the north and northwest uh, portion of the facility. The actual breach occurred at more or less this location where the pointer is. Uh, and this location within the perimeter dam was actually a lower portion, lower portion of the structure than the main dam. Um, the, uh, in order to orient ourselves here, uh, we will be talking of downstream and upstream when we look at the breach. So downstream means you're standing in the embankment looking out. Upstream is you're looking in the impoundment and to orient oneself left and right uh, looking out, the abutment, would, a abutment on the left would be the left abutment. Looking out, the abutment on the right abutment on the right would be the right abutment. So you'll see those terms coming forward in our discussions presently, and, and uh, that's for orienting ourselves. There were several interesting and, and, and special features of the nature of the collapse. Firstly, it occurred at a part of the facility that was lower than the main dam. And it also occurred over a rather limited length, perhaps in the order, the, the breach was in the order of 150 meters or so in width. And thirdly, it occurred without any apparent warning. That is to say, there wasn't a period of days before in which a structure was cracking and deforming that would have allowed uh, mitigation to take place. Um, it, uh, we went to some effort to establish the timeline of observation prior to the failure, and there were people working <coughs> down at the foot of the structure some hours before the failure and had no evidence of water gushing out or anything like that. So these were immediate uh, indications that there is something to look at that may be more local than is generally widespread everywhere, which began to uh, began our thinking process as we proceeded. Uh, we must also, because we're going to be talking about the nature of the structure itself, identify how it was composed, or the components of the cross-section. What you have here is a cross-section in a simplified manner of what the uh, embankment looked like. And you'll see certain letters. And I'll speak to each of these letters and tell you what they refer to. The letter S is called the, is the core of the dam. It's composed of relatively fine-grained materials from glacial deposits that are dug up locally, compacted in layers. And the duty of zone S is to be relatively impervious. It's the water control element in the cross section. It's not totally impervious, but it, it is the seepage control element. To the downstream of the structure, looking out the downstream, you see zone C. Zone C is rock fill. It might be rock fill that's quarried or rock fill waste from the mine. And it is, its duty is to be strong and to hold everything up. This core itself is not particularly strong. It's held up by this rock fill zone acting, if you will, uh, as a supporting system. In between, we have two other zones, F and T, F and T. If water can percolate slowly through the core, if it were to pick up fine material in so doing, the, the pores or the holes in the rock fill are rather large, and it could actually take material in the core into the rock fill unless it was protected from doing that. So the duty of uh, zone F is to act as a filter to allow water to pass through the core, small amounts of water, but to stop any any solid material from migrating out of the core so that it doesn't develop holes. The duty of T is to do the, have the same function because the, uh, the difference between the pores or the, 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 the size of the, per, the pores in the filter, the, which is a sort of sandy gravel, to the rock fill is still large, and T acts as a transition to stop the migration of the filter into the rock fill. So this is cross section is a fill dam uh, with the uh, with the components indicated here, and there's one other component which is U, and it is the upstream fill. You'll see that the dam tilts a little in the upstream direction and needs support from uh, the strength and deformability or limited deformability of this zone U. 
further upstream of Zone U are the tailings as collected in the dam, and there would in, uh, in general be also a free water zone sitting on top of the tail. So that, as we go for forward discussing what, what components of the structure acted effectively and what didn't, we'll be referencing the core, referencing uh, filters, referencing rock fill, and the like. Now, based on our experience with both water dams and tailings dams, failings elsewhere, uh, we identified at the outset that there were four classes of failure mechanisms, four kind of theories, if you will, how this might have failed that we had to investigate. Firstly, human intervention. There were word on the street, so to speak, that all this failed because of sabotage, as an extreme example of what might have been human intervention. Secondly, it might have failed because of inadequate water control and the water pond overtopped the structure and eroded it out. Thirdly, it might have failed because of the phenomenon that we call piping and cracking, and that's exactly the interaction between that core zone and the filter zone. That if, for example, the particles were to migrate out of the dam, that would create a little pipe, water could flow out and ultimately erode, or it might crack. And fourthly, it might have failed through the foundation. We found no evidence of failure due to intervention. There might have been, for example, pipes left unattended with water eroding and things like that. We found no evidence of that. We found no evidence that there was failure due to overtopping prior to the breach development. There had been a rainstorm in May prior to the failure in which there had been an excursion of water onto the core leading to a potential overtopping incident. That was a reportable incident to the regulator and the, after that the reservoir in the dam was tightly managed and all of the detailed information we've collected indicated that it was below the retention of the impervious core. It did not fail by overtopping. There were a number of indicators that this issue of piping, uh, of, of inadequate control of migration through the core may have been a concern, but ultimately we concluded that the, uh, it did not fail because of those conditions, which left, and we had early indication that this would be the major contender, which left that failure in the foundation was the mechanism that we had to pay the greatest attention to. Now, to avoid, if you like, a suspense style, and we'll come to the more detailed evidence that led us to the conclusion, we concluded that the evidence indicates that the failure uh, indicates the breach was the result of a failure in the foundation of the embankment because of the presence of what was a glacial lake deposit, glacial lacustrine layer in the, bank, in the embankment's foundation. You'll find in the report we concluded that the dominant contribution to the failure resides in the design. The design did not take into account the complexity of the subglacial and preglacial geological environment associated with the perimeter embankment foundation. As a result, foundation investigations and associated site characterization failed to identify this continuous layer in the vicinity of the breach and to recognize it was susceptible to undrained failure when subject to the stresses associated with the embankment. That was a key finding, and we'll now turn our, turn our attention to answering the question, what did we find that led us to that kind of conclusion? And I'll ask my colleague Steve Vick to take us through that narrative. Uh, what I'd like to do is give you a bit of a roadmap to the materials that you'll be receiving immediately following our, our briefing here in the news release and later in the report so that you can understand some of the terminology and, and understand some of the concepts we're trying to get across. And I'll start uh, by looking here at a video clip that 
from the caribou video, as we call it, that you just saw, that video was, was incredibly helpful to us and, and also very unusual. It's unusual for us to see in these failure investigations the actual failure taking place. And um, what happened was that failure initiated, as near as we can tell, at about 1 in the morning on August 4th. And uh, at daybreak, the Caribou Regional District mobilized a helicopter headed up by about 8 and, and, and took these videos for us that allow us to see the, the end of the actual failure process in motion. So, Nerdy showed you a cartoon of the, a, colored, a colored picture of the different zones of the dam. Now we can actually see on the ground what he was talking about. The, um, Okay, the S, material labeled S, here and here, that's that glacial till. And if you look at it, uh, if you look at it up close, it looks like concrete. It's a mixture of sand and gravel, small gravel and, and silt and clay, and it's also very hard and erosion resistant. So you can see here that there's actually, there's an, a remnant that's the original compacted core of the lower portion of the dam that at this point, through the, through the failure process, almost the end of the failure process, it's actually survived. And we were able to go back and, and, and excavate into that and, and find some very important evidence for it. So we have this glacial till uh, core material exposed on both sides of the breach. Oh. Um. Here's that rock fill mine waste that Norty talked about, the zone C. Now over here on this abutment, zone D, that means disturbed material, and that's very interesting because you can see here that the, the remnant of the, of the core that's sticking out directed the water around to the left abutment. In the process of doing that, it created an eddy behind it that preserved um, this D material on the right side. So if, there were, if this was a crash investigation, this zone D material would be our wreckage that we looked at. And it was very informative for us to, to be able to see that preserved part of the actual slide material. Um, a curious feature down here that, that, that we've never really seen um, before in these kinds of failures is what's called W. Um, it's a linear feature, and it goes across where, what was originally the downstream toe of the dam. And here you can see it's, actually, it's, it's risen up, and it's actually acting as a small dam in backing up that water that's flowing out. W, we call it the whaleback, um, and I'll show you why in a minute. Here's looking at that left abutment, and the dashed lines indicate lift lines. This material, this is the mine waste rock film material, it was placed in layers and compacted in layers and some of those layers remain uh, as indicated by the dashed lines and we see that they're tilted. This is very important. Um, that, mean, that tells us that this whole body of the dam rotated. There's our S, our, our glacial till material exposed again. K in the background, that is material that's being placed as a temporary dike uh, at the time this photo was taken. It was not part of the original failure. We want to label it for you so, you so that you know what it is and why it's there. But it was not there originally. Um, here's our whale back feature down here. And you can understand a little bit why we, why we call it that. Now here's looking at the other side, the right side. And we begin to see some really interesting features. This is that D on the, that, we, that we showed before. And now we can actually see a zone of upthrust here. This was the dam that moved bodily upward along this scarp at the bottom. Um, continued on. Sorry, we'll get rid of that. It continued on to this uh, area indicated L, and here's our whaleback feature across the breach. Okay, now we can see 
that the whale back lines up with these scarps, and they're really one and the same feature. Up here, H indicates down drop scarps. We have some open cracks up at the top. So now we can begin to see the full picture of what happened. This uh, material all the way from the left side to what you see over here bodily rotated. The toe came up. The crest sank down. And as it did that, it pushed out. Pushed out along here. Total distance of about 11 meters. It rose up here at least three and a half. So we had major uh, mass movement of the body of the dam. <clears throat> and again, just as a reminder, go back to what Norty just showed you to reorient you. Um, the main dam is this structure down here. That dammed off the original valley. The first thing that was built in 1997 as that dam was progressively raised st step by step, it exceeded the, uh, it exceeded the height of the, of the sides of the valley. And the perimeter, of perimeter embankment was constructed up on the top uh, of, the, of the map to confine the tailings. And the breach occurred, let's see if I can get this. The breach occurred right here at this corner. So now you know what we're looking at, and I'll show you the sections that we constructed uh, showing the step-by-step -step progression of how the dam was raised. So each of these lines and numbers indicates an elevation. Generally speaking, uh, this material was added at one year at a time. And we compiled this main dam up on the top and the, and the perimeter dam down on the bottom. We compiled these from from hundreds of documents, design documents, construction documents, inspection documents. So if you will, this information, once we had it all together, was our cockpit voice recorder. We could, we could look at the decisions that were made, understand how they were made, and the reasoning behind them. This was a second part of our investigation that was very important to us. And what it showed us, gave us the big picture, it showed us there were, there were different things going on during the design process for the main dam up at the top and for the perimeter dam down in the bottom. And in particular, on the main dam, there was weak material in the foundation that was recognized to be there. So as the dam grew higher, it had to be buttressed by that material, that brown material that sticks out at the toe of the slope. Well, something happened at about elevation 951. Um, they ran short of material. They ran short of rock fill. And they decided to steepen the slope as a result. They didn't have quite enough material to build it the way it was supposed to have been built at a flatter slope. When I say two to one, I mean two meters out for every meter up. The slope was steepened to actually 1.4 to one substantially steepened at that time. But they knew that there was weak material in the foundation at the main dam, and they dealt with it by, even, even with the steepened slope, by adding the buttress. Now down below, the perimeter embankment, what we're showing you here is where the breach occurred. That was a different story. The weak material was not recognized to be present. So all the stability analyses that were done didn't account for that material. They were, the stability analyses were showing a green light. In actual fact, two things were happening. One is that, the, again, the slope was being steepened. But the second thing that's very important is that the character of that material was changing. Its strength behavior was changing. You, you'll, you'll see a lot of discussion in the report about this. What was happening is that that material that was underneath in the foundation had previously been acting as a stiff material, a, a strong material. But once the dam reached a certain height, again, roughly here, the character of that material changed to more of a weak material. So you, you, what was originally strong changed, it, changed its strength behavior, and there were problems uh, from there on out. I want to say a word about water management. Norty mentioned it before. 
there was a, you see the little chart up on the right. That is how much water was stored on top of the tailings beginning in 2007. And you can see things went pretty well. The, the, the amount of water was actually reducing until 2010. That's the bottom, of the, the bottom of the graph. But after that, it started increasing exponentially. So that by the time the failure occurred, there was almost 10 million cubic meters of water on top of the tailings. Now let me emphasize again that the water did not cause the failure. But the water had an effect on the failure. Let's don't reverse, be careful we don't reverse cause and effect. What all of that water did was it enhanced the amount of tailings that were released once the breach occurred. So um, if we hadn't had so much water, we would not have gotten so much tailings released. We often see in these kinds of failures, we often see a mud flow. Tailings come out uh, in, in a liquefied state. That didn't happen here. The tailings came out by erosion. Any, any, any good farmer would immediately recognize that we're looking at an erosion situation here. So the amount of material lost had a great deal to do with the amount of water that was available to remove it. Um, here's what we did in the field. There's a picture of, of some of the drilling that we did. Now that we've had these indications of rotational movement and outward movement, now we want to drill down. We want to find out what's in the ground. And in fact, um, this is where we discovered the weak material that, that went unrecognized during the design. So at one point, there's quite a bit of activity here. You can imagine we had to get this done before freeze out. Uh, at one point, there were many, as many as four or five drill rigs operating simultaneously here. And the object of all this activity was to get us samples so that we could test the materials and determine their properties. And Nordy will now describe to you uh, what that was all about. Thank you, Steve. So we've identified that failure occurred in the foundation. We've, identif we've undertaken a fairly major field investigation to drill and sample and do various testing in the ground. And much of the documentation of the details are presented in the appendices of the report that you see sitting before you. The key objective to close the circle of saying, well, we, where, we know where the failure took place. We've identified the stratum in which it took place by virtue of seeing these samples. If we now were to take a specimen of that material and, and test it to find the strength and do a calculation, would everything come together and say, yes, the properties of that material are consistent with the failure that occurred. So that's the way we wanted to close the circle. Getting samples here, by no means a trivial undertaking. Uh, we used, uh, with the assistance of our, our consultants, pretty advanced technology. You have to push in a tube and we've checked for in integrity of, of structure using x-rays and CT scanning. And you can see some of the material gets rather jumbled up and some of the tubes break or get twisted because of uh, rocks that they have to go through. The, the important feature is to get a sample that is undisturbed in our parlance and is, will be able to give us representative information when taken to the laboratory. So what we have here is a scan of this glacial lake deposit, GLU, upper GLU as it's called, and you can see good quality of continuity of the little lenses reflecting the depositional history of this material, and we would then take specimens, portions of that, into equipment in a laboratory full of various kinds of test equipment uh, in order to determine the strength of this material. Time doesn't permit the details of all of these processes, but everything is explained and the results are all tabulated in the reports that will be available to you fairly soon. So we've got then, our next step is we've got testing from the laboratory can, that represents good quality information of the strength of this material going through the process that Steve alluded to that as you put more load on this material, it got somewhat weaker and the laboratory data reflects that. And we now do an analysis. Now, this is a cross-section of the, of the dike that failed based on the best available stratigraphy we've determined. 
there is a till zone beneath the dam in the foundation. Here is this upper glacial lake deposit in blue, or cyan, of it is the critical weak element, and there's some other layers below it. The analysis that we do asks a computer to say, well, we know the strength of these other materials above this uh, uh, glacial lake deposit well. Let us, find the let us find the strength associated with the lower layer that will create a failure that reflects the kind of shear zone of, of, of sliding down and translating out and rotating upward, creating the kind of whaleback feature that we know we saw in the field that reflects the thrusting upward of this upper till. So these are calculations that, that are part of our business, and we then calculate a strength consistent with what's called a factor safety unity, which says this is a mechanism that's on the brink of failure. The strength that we back calculate from that uh, analysis fits very well with the kind of laboratory values that we've determined. So the circle is closed. That one can demonstrate that the strength developed under this loading is the strength consistent with the failure that occurred. So we've identified the shape of the failure, the location, its strength characterization, and it all comes together consistently in an analytical framework. Which then leads us to a summary statement about root cause, which I'll come to. Root cause of the breach was the undrained failure, this is the style of the failure, the undrained failure of the upper GLU under the imposed load of the perimeter embankment on August 4, 2014. The design did not take into account the complexity of the subglacial and preglacial geological environment associated with the perimeter embankment foundation. There are a lot of complex depositional processes going on when the glacier was wasting there. The emissions associated with site characterization may be likened to creating a loaded gun. So we've gone ahead and built on this weak layer. But if constructing unknowingly on this upper GLU deposit constituted loading the gun, building with the steep slope, the 1.3 to 1 slope that Steve described, pulled the trigger. The two things together constitute the root cause of the failure. Let me go on to other considerations of the panel before we come toward the end of having identified mechanisms and so on where we're going. Uh, we spent some time uh, uh, assessing management oversight on these processes. Uh, and there are some issues associated with management responsibilities. Some had to do with water balance concerns that you'll find the report talked about. Some had to do with questions about construction material delivery. But we were not able to offer an adequate assessment of the role of management and oversight in its contribution to the cause of failure, primarily because to pursue into details of contracts and related things and, and instructions and so forth was going into roles and responsibilities that we thought was beyond our remit. We were content that we had enough information to deal with the physical cause. Turning to regulatory oversight, we were uh, um, indeed instructed to explore that and, and had uh, a better basis to do that based on the files of the regulator, based on interviews with the regulator and the like. And uh, we explored the issue of inspections, explored the, uh, the, the uh, comments that the regulator had made uh, to the engineer during the evolution of the, stru of the structure. And if you, look through our written report in some detail, you'll find that the regulator actually made a number of very insightful observations, uh, asking the engineer to, to comment on, and in fact, under the guidance of the regulator, the structure was in the process before it failed of being buttressed uh, uh, to stabilize. We find that the geotechnical staff and the contract inspectors that are part of the team are well qualified to perform their responsibilities. However, despite a strong regulatory process and personnel, the perimeter embankment still failed. It's a, and a sudden failure without warning. Additional inspections of the TSF would not have prevented the failure. 
There was nothing to see. There were no instruments that could have given an indication of failure, at least at the location where it occurred, and so forth. So um, we, this is, does not imply that uh, regulatory process uh, can't be improved. We, we will make some recommendations in due course to assist the regulator in the future, but uh, uh, we're content with those uh, conclusions. I think we now turn our attention to where we're going in conclusions and recommendations, and I'll ask Steve to come back and take us to the end of our presentation. You can recall from our terms of reference that Nordy introduced just moments ago that one of our charges was to provide recommendations on how we could ensure that a failure like Mount Polly would not occur again in the future. Ensure is a very powerful word, and we took it very seriously for exactly what it means. And if we're going to ensure that these future failures don't occur, um, the panel recognizes that we can't continue business as usual. Um, it's not enough to just tweak around the edges of what, we're, of what we've been doing and say we promise to do better in the future. That won't cut it. Ensure also means that we're, we have to move toward a zero acceptable rate of failures. No, fa no, no failures are acceptable under the, the task we've been given. And in order to get there, um, we can't continue to use technology that's fundamentally 100 years old. That's current technology started about then. Um, we have to have changes in, in that technology, but along with changes in technology, we need changes in practices. So we've got a two-fold approach here, a dual approach. We're recommending changes in, changes to best available technology and adoption of best available practices. Now, what does, um, as I just mentioned, here it is. I can describe to you what um, uh, one example of best available technology. Um, this is a filtered tailings uh, facility at the Greens Creek Mine on Admiralty Island in Alaska. And the important thing here is what you don't see. You don't see a dam, and you don't see water on top of the dam. Instead, these tailings are, are filtered, they're dewatered in the mill, and they're trucked in a, a moist form to this impoundment, where they're placed and compacted in this domed configuration that it, instead of impounding water, it does just the reverse. It allows uh, water to run off. And that's, that's the purpose, to, to avoid that water impoundment that we have in conventional technology. Um, you also see some other things here. You see the dark area in the background. That's a, a geosynthetic liner, so it protects the groundwater from seepage. And also in this particular case, the slopes uh, have been revegetated concurrently um, with the deposition of the material. And we're proposing that things move in that direction from the standpoint of technology. Um, best available practices require considerations that go beyond stability analyses. Remember the stability analyses for the perimeter dam, they were giving a green light. Well, we need to go beyond that and not rely exclusively on these analyses. Um, instead, we need to look at safety from an integrated standpoint, starting with the very beginning of planning and carried all the way through to operations. And some of the ways that we're calling in the report to do that involve um, corporate design responsibilities, corporate um, instructions and the initial planning uh, of, of tailings management, and also the establishment of independent tailings review boards to guide the process through design and, and into operation and help provide both management and regulators with information that they need to know. So to wrap up, we'll, um, we'll run you through the conclusions again. The breach of the perimeter embankment on August 4, 2014 was caused by sheer failure of the dam foundations. 
when the loading imposed by the dam exceeded the capacity of these materials to, to sustain it. So basically, the weight of the dam was too much for the weak materials in the foundation to bear. The weaker glacial lacustrine layer was in a small area, a small localized area. Uh, it went undetected for two reasons. First of all, um, uh, because the, the, the subsurface investigations, the original drilling that was done, was not designed to detect these kinds of small features. And it was not designed to detect them because the design didn't appreciate how important they were to the stability of the, of the structure, and in particular, this change in behavior that occurred when the dam height uh, reached a certain elevation. Uh, throughout the design, Throughout, the design investigations took note of the stiff, dense character of the foundation soils and used corresponding strength properties in the stability analysis, but it was not recognized that this character would change with a corresponding change in strength behavior under the increased loading as the dam grew higher. Added to that was the problem of the steepened slopes at, that occurred at about the same time this change of behavior took place. So here's a summary of our recommendations. First of all, to implement best available technology, to phase it in over time. Um, our existing impoundments that have been designed uh, using older principles will eventually uh, be removed from the inventory by attrition as, as they fill up um, and, and, and are closed. Uh, but new impoundments need to really uh, strongly consider this uh, best available technology that we've described. Uh, to improve corporate governance and expand corporate design commitments uh, to enhance validation of safety and regulation of all phases. Let me summarize these, these points to you. Um, when you walk on a mine site, before you walk on a mine site anywhere in the world, You've got to have your personal safety equipment. You wear a hard hat, you wear safety glasses, you wear safety boots. There's a strong commitment in the industry to personal safety. We want to extend that commitment to the safety of these structures. And, and right now, the way tailing dams are, 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 are planned, many important decisions occur during the economic evaluation phase early in a project. And, and safety considerations follow along after that. Fundamentally, there's an economic feasibility study. If the project is economically feasible, then uh, the components are, are designed within that context. We want to reverse that. The first thing that should happen is that the safety evaluation should be performed, and we, we choose methods and practices that put safety first, and then evaluate the economics in that context. So that's where we're headed with this. Um, as Norty mentioned, number five, um, there are some ways we've recommended to strengthen current uh, regulatory operations, and we understand uh, some of those um, moves have, have recently begun. We need to improve professional practice to help us, to help the profession better understand the kind of conditions that occurred at Mount Polly and deal with them effectively. And we need to improve the dam safety guidelines that, that determine the factors of safety and the kinds of stability requirements that were implemented in Mount Pauly. So, so we feel that we've provided a clear direction forward. We're not in a position to implement uh, these things into policy, but we've turned this over to government for their consideration, and, and, and we're hopeful and confident that they will be acted on in the future. And, and that's our presentation, and we thank you for your attention. <laughs>